darkness veiled the sky the day that Jesus died in agony upon the bitter cross they took his body down and laid it in a tomb his friends believed that everything was lost but when the third day came the darkness turned to light for mary heard her name and saw the living christ risen to set the captives free changed for hope was born when Jesus rose that day and still his wounded hands reveal the love he has for every fallen soul he came to save and he will come Good morning, everyone, again. Good he, is risen. he is risen indeed. That was pretty good. But I think we'll do a little better. And good morning to those of you on the other side of Video Land. And welcome into Easter Sunday morning at the Worldwide Television Studios of Longmeadow Church of the Brethren. I am your evangelist. <laughs> Why does everybody laugh when I say that? Our scripture lesson today, of course, comes from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And while you're looking that up, the pastor had had enough. He was watching that man on the back row every Sunday. That man fell asleep. Every Sunday. The minute he got up and he started preaching, the man would go to sleep. And he said, I've had enough of it. This is the Sunday I'm going to teach him a lesson. And so he got into it real hard and heavy and he waited 
and he was in the throes of it, and he looked back there, and he saw that fellow was sound asleep, and he stopped, and he got in the microphone, and he said, everybody in here that wants to go to heaven, stand up. Of course, the whole church stood up except for him. He was asleep. He said, all right, sit down. He said, everybody in this church that wants to go to hell, stand up. And the man woke up on the word, stand up, and he stood up. And he looked around for a moment at everybody sitting down. He said, preacher, I don't know where we're going or what we're doing, but we're the only two standing. <laughs> Told him a lesson, didn't he? John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put Him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed, though they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. And I do not know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to your brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things. May God add His blessings to this passage as we seek Him in prayer. Please join me. Father, we thank You. We ask that these words from You reach us. That they lift us. That they carry us. That they are for all of us. Father, strengthen our hearts as we receive this message being reminded of what it took to get to this point today. And ever thankful we are that He walked out of that tomb. Bind us through this service, Father. In Jesus' name and all of His children said, Amen. Now, for those of you that weren't here on on Friday night, Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to pardon me here and excuse me. i got to do one short bit of business. And I hate to throw it in right here. But here's where it's going to fall. With this new way we're doing things, I get a little bit sideways. And I happen to read down in here that uh, we have two birthdays that we didn't say anything about. And one of them is Peggy Kiefer. And the other one is Mary Hawes. And I know Mary watches this, and I know Peggy's here. And I can tell because her face is turning red. So you at home, along with us here, please, before we get back to business, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday 
to you. Happy birthday, Peggy and Rose. Happy birthday to you. Amen. i got to get used to this new schedule. That's all right. But if you were here Friday night, you saw that we took the walk with Jesus. You saw that we saw everything. And as my wife loves to tell me after the Good Friday service, when we get out, and I'm going to do it exactly like she says it, she gets in the truck, slams the door shut, scares me. And I look over at her and she's got this, well, you did it again. You brought that nasty, horrible, disgusting service. And it was wonderful. Shame on you. And on Good Friday night, we had six sinners come up and bear their soul. Those six sinners are with us today. And I would invite those six sinners to come up and read out yet again. Hello, my name was Selfish. I used to take anything I want. I saw the world as mine. I used to live for me, but today, in this moment, I learn no longer to do. I have to be that person. Jesus came, lived, and died for me. The price for my sins, Jesus paid. My name was Selfish. But now my name is giving, and today, for all of us, Jesus rose from the grave. Hello, my name was Jealousy. I could not stand anyone who, was more, who had more than me. I despised everyone. I hated that person who had everything right in their life, and I always felt like I deserved it more. And then Jesus came, a king with a crown of thorns, beaten and shamed, but still loving us. I learned everything I am is because of Jesus, and my name was Jealousy, but now my name is Joy. And today, for all of us, Jesus rose from the grave. Hello, my name was Pride. I used to think there was nothing wrong with me. Now I know that I do not have control in everything. I realize that because Jesus died and taught me the servant's heart with his life, I can do so much more with my life for others, and I will. My name was pride, but now my name is humble, and today for all of us, Jesus rose from the grave. Hello, my name was Greed. I used to simply want it all. If I saw someone was more than me, I could not sleep until I have what they have, and more. I now see that my love for possessions and my love for my money, more than family or friends, nearly destroyed me and everyone around me. Jesus came with nothing, yet gave everything he had when he died. My name was Greed, but now my name is Generous. And today, for all of us, Jesus rose from the grave. Hello, my name was Anger. People never did good enough to suit me, and it made me angry. I used to walk around all day long with an attitude that told people to stay away. And if that didn't work, I got angry. But then came Jesus. And when they mocked, beat, and spit on him, he did not get angry. He continued to love them. My heart now understands the truth of Jesus. My name was anger, but now my name is love. And today, for all of us, Jesus rose from the grave. Hello, my name was Lost. I was never sure where I was, and so oftentimes I just went with, with the crowd. I feared being 
so alone and outcast, I did things to try to fit in and follow the wrong direction. But then I met Jesus and found out he knew me. Jesus, too, was an outcast, and the crowd hated him because he was not like them. But Jesus still loved them. My name was lost, but now my name is Hope. And today, for all of us, Jesus rose from the grave. Martin Luther, during his family devotions, read the account of Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice. We remember the story in Genesis chapter 22 where God took the son that he gave and asked him to be sacrificed upon an altar. And during this time, during these readings, his wife Katie stopped him and said, I do not believe God would have treated a son like that. I do not believe he would have allowed that kind of treatment. And Martin Luther, with tears in his eyes, looked at her and said, But Katie, he did. My name is sin. I am greed. I am jealousy. I am anger. I am pride. I am lost. I am selfish. And Jesus Christ died so that I would know my sins, know His love, and be lifted up. For all of us, Jesus rose today. You forgive me. I can't do this anymore. Whew. I hate wearing suit coats. Ignacy Jan Paderewski. I got that one right because I had to practice that one. Ignacy Jan Paderewski. And I bet you ain't nary a person in here knows who he was. We're Annalie. Don't you know? All oh, for shame. He was the third prime minister of Poland. You knew that, didn't you? Yeah. You're in church. <laughs> On Easter Sunday, woman, I am going to have to have a talk with you. He was the third prime minister of Poland. He was such a special individual. He had a thought for Christ. He had a heart for giving. He had a heart for reconciliation. He had a heart for the plight of the Jewish people. And yet, that's not what you remember him for. Paderewski was a phenomenal piano player. <clears throat> he became legendary at age 11 for his piano skills. He received a kiss given to his teacher from Beethoven. At the end of his first recital, the teacher walked over to Jan and kissed him on the forehead and said, Beethoven, who was my teacher, gave me that kiss and told me to hold on to it till I found someone worthy of it. Today I did. That was Paderewski. He became so famous, so powerful in politics, so desirous to unite, so desirous, desirous to bring people together, that he said, I play for all of us. I work for all of us. And in fact, in 1922, when he retired from politics, and returned to his musical life, his first concert held at Carnegie Hall was a success. And in New York, in 1923 or 4, he played Madison Square Garden to the tune of 25,000 people. Amazing. He toured the United States in his own private rail car. I kind of think I should have my own private rail car to tour around in. What do you think? Yeah, you agree with that? But yet you won't let me have any more tractors. 
But there were two young men working their way through Leland Stanford University. Stanford University. And they run out of money. They were broke. The idea came to them, Paderewski is around here. He lives near here. Let's get him out for a piano recital and we'll devote the profits to their board and their tuition so they can continue their education. The great pianist's manager asked them for a guarantee of $2,000. The students undaunted proceeded to stage the concert. They worked hard only to find that the concert had only raised $1,600. After the concert, the students were brokenhearted knowing that they were going to have to come up with this and they sought the great artist out. And they explained to him, we only have $1,600. But here's a note in our good name, a promissory note, that we will come up with the remaining four hundred dollars and cover what we agreed to. Paderewski leaned back and said, no, I'm afraid that won't do. And the color and the horror began as they were about to be embarrassed beyond what they could be. And then in front of them, he tore the note to shreds, handed the money back to him and said, now then, take out of the $1,600 all your expenses and keep for each of you 10% of the balance for your work and then send me the rest. That was it. No more was said about it. The years rolled by, fortune and destiny. Paderewski had become a premier of Poland, and then came the devastating war. And Paderewski was striving with might and main to feed the starving thousands of his beloved homeland of Poland. He didn't know how he would take care of all of them. Everything was destitute and shook to the very core. There was only one man in the world who could help him and his people. And suddenly thousands of tons of food and medical supplies began to come in to Poland for distribution by the Polish premier. And after the starving people were fed, Paderewski joined, journeyed excuse me, to Paris to thank the man that sent him his relief. It's all right, Mr. Paderewski, came the man's reply. I don't know if you'll remember it, but you helped me once when I was a student in college, becoming destitute in a bad way. I just wanted to do something to help for all of you. Paderewski grasped the man's hand in both hands and with tears thanked him. Paderewski was thanking Herbert Hoover, our president. For all of us. That's what this day is all about. You understand? I, I know you've heard that scripture. I only get to read from that scripture once a year. Every now and then, I'll sneak it in somewhere else. But that scripture, this moment, is for this day. It is to remind us of who we are. We're lost, we're sinners. We're wretched. We don't deserve what happened. And yet on that bloody cross, crowned by thorns, and I invite, I invite anybody who wants to come up and grab a hold of that crown. I, matter of fact, I triple dog dare you. I got 50 cents here in one of my pockets. I'll give it to you if you'll just come up and grab that thing. And do you know how I know how sharp it is? I've told you all 100,000 times I am not a smart man. And years ago, when Peggy, that thing come from Israel. From Israel. And when years ago, when Peggy brought that thing in, she goes, I have this crown of thorns. And it's in a box, in a protective wrapper, with everything on it to keep you from doing exactly what I'm about to do. And I opened the box up and I said, wow, look at this. And I reached and I grabbed it. And after the screams subsided and the blood stopped running, our Savior wore that crown for this day for all of us. Amen. We go back into that Scripture and we see something. We read it again and again 
and again. And yes, it's the same story. And yes, this is what Easter's all about. And yes, I'm going to use that Scripture again. And yes, I'm going to preach from it. Because for all of us, Jesus died. And for all of us, He rose up and walked out of a sealed tomb. Back to the Scripture, please. Early on the first day of the week, today, today, it was still dark. Mary Magdalene, who had been there while Jesus died on that cross, had stayed there, was part of what saw to it that His body came down from that wretched tree and got buried properly. Went to the tomb to look. Went there to see what was going on. Went there to minister and make sure that the spices were there. Now on the way, she has to know that there's been a large tomb. And elsewhere in the Scripture we read that in His pride, He was told that they would come try to take the body. And so Pilate, and I love it, Pilate said, no problem. Go put some guards there and take some wax and put my seal on it. No one will dare break the seal of the great Paul uh, Pontius Pilate. No one will do it. Got to love that. And yet in other scripture we read that somewhere in the night came a great earthquake and the stone rolled away by itself and the guards were scared and they ran. But on her way that morning, she does not know. She does not understand yet that this is going to happen. And so she arrives there. She finds the stone is gone. She takes off running to Simon Peter. And for those of you who do not understand who the other disciple is in these writings, it's John. He didn't feel worthy to name himself when writing this down. But the other disciple is John. She takes off and she finds him. She says they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. And they take off running. And they get there. And John stops short. Not knowing what he's going to see. Scared. Afraid. Because at this moment, they don't understand that their Savior, all their hope, all their trust, all their love, everything has been put into that moment. Gone! Peter, I, every now and then, in this feeble gray matter up here, I envision this scene of them running, right? Peter and John, and John is just booking it, and he gets past him. And Peter with the big mouth, we all know Peter, he gets wound up real tight and tightens that spring up a little more, and John stops and Peter goes running past him. Whoop! I'm wondering if he actually meant to run past him that fast. It don't matter, he winds up in there and he sees nothing. Cloth, but more telling, is the folded wrap. And then John walks in. And they tremble and they try to figure out what's going on. And Peter and John go back to their homes, shook up, still not understanding, seeing that something has happened. But Mary, as she continues to cry, stands there. And two angels appear. Why are you crying? He told you this was going to happen. He told you He was going to die for all of us. He told you again and again and again. Why are you crying? And in her innocence, and I, I, I point to this Scripture because this is where the power comes from. From her. The power of this Scripture is the ability of us to feel Mary's pain. I don't know where they've taken him. Can you just tell me? Please. I want to go and mend him. And Jesus arrives. She turns around and sees the gardener standing there. And he asks her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Stop. For all of us, in that moment, Jesus' compassion, love, and spirit flows out. 
He hurts for her because she did not understand. It was not ready yet. Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, I still cannot get past the next verse. I have to look away and try to talk so I can just kind of fit it in because if I have to read it the way the Scripture is read, Jesus says to her, Mary. In that moment, a wave of emotions comes over her. In that moment, everything becomes real. In that moment, everything in the world stops revolving. In that moment, she now knows that what He had said for all of us, He would suffer, die, and rise again that we may live forever. And she reaches for Him he has to stop her. Not yet. Not yet. At that moment, right there, hope became a real word. All through the Bible, all through everything, all through history, up to this point, all we do is read about hope and faith and love, hope and faith and love, hope and faith and love, blah, 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 blah. And everybody just says it. Oh, I got hope. Like, I don't know. I hope that when I get to the grocery store and I have to check out, there's nobody in any of the lines. Well, I can tell you right now, that hope never gets answered. And we have love. Oh, man, I love these jalapeno peppers. I just eat them things. Later on, we realize that that's not love. And I have faith. I have faith that somehow, some way, during this time today, I'm going to do something just right. And by once a week, I hit that. Faith, hope, and love. But today, this moment, this spot, this place, hope became real because Jesus Christ walked out of that tomb. I have suffered through it. That's wrong. I have watched it. I have watched it on multiple occasions, the movie that Mel Gibson did, The Passion of the Christ. And boy, let me tell you, when that thing came out, there was a lot of people who said, oh, oh, that's not quite right. I don't care. It was good enough for me that it hurt me to my very core. But all of that, all of that movie, all of that comes down to a single moment. You know what that moment is? At the end of the movie, light comes in the tomb and he walks out. Say amen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You know, them people on the other side of the camera hollering louder than you. That's what it came today. And we have hope. And we can believe in that word. A man approached a little league baseball game one afternoon. He had been watching it and he asked the boy in the dugout, he said, what was the score? And the little boy, the little ball player responded, 18 to nothing, sir. We're behind. And the man said, what? How in the world? How are you so happy? Aren't you discouraged? And the little boy smiled. Why should I be discouraged? We haven't even gotten up to bat yet. <laughs> That's hope. That's real hope. That's hope, 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 hope. Believe, 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 believe. And that's what came out of it today. And for all of us, we have been shown today what we need to give over and over and over again. But you've heard these words before. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels that have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, surrender my body to the flames, and have not love, I gain nothing. Pay attention to these words. Love is patient. Come on, you know them. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put my childish ways behind me. Now, we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Brothers and sisters, for all of us today, He showed His love with what He did. I know Good Friday was hard. And I know that we have to stop and think about that. And I know we have to quote unquote celebrate it. Why? Because we have to. Because we have to be constantly reminded of what He was, who He is, and what He did to get to to this point. To get us to where we are. To get us to where we know that cancer is out there. And we know it. And some of us are going to get it. But we know that His death, His resurrection, will take us home. There is pain, there is trial, there is tribulation. There is every day trying to figure out why is my job this way? Why is my family this way? Why is my marriage this way? Why do these things happen to me? And yet, because I believe in Jesus Christ, because I believe in what He did, how He lived, who He was, and the fact that on this day He walked out of that tomb, I know He has me. And I know one day this imperfect will go away. And I just need to make sure that I do what He taught and love. Gregory of Nazarenius in A.D. 381 wrote these words. He began his ministry by being hungry. Yet Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty. Yet he is the living water. Jesus was weary. Yet he is our rest. Jesus paid tribute. Yet he is the king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. Jesus wept, yet he wipes away our tears. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death forever. For all of us. That's what I want you to say today. When somebody says, He is risen, and you respond, He is risen indeed, I want you to end it with, For all of us. Let's try it, shall we? I've given you fair warning. He is risen. He is risen indeed for all of us. Well, that was pretty good. I have a bag full of lollipops. (laughs) Oh, I'm not sharing them with you. Well, maybe. John of Damascus wrote, The day of resurrection, earth tell it abroad. The Passover of gladness, the Passover of God. From death to life eternal, from this world to the sky, our Christ has brought us over with hymns of victory. Now let the heavens be joyful. Let earth her song begin. Let round the world keep triumph and all that, there's, all that is therein. Let all the things seen and unthing their notes and gladness blend. For Christ the Lord has risen. Our joy will have no end. Now let me ask you a question. Do you truly know what happened today? My goodness gracious, you all are quiet. Does anybody know what truly happened today? He is risen. He is risen. Apparently, we need a reminder. Stand up. That means you too as well at home. 
up. I am going to remind you exactly to the letter what happened today. Let's see if you can uh, say it along with me. Are you ready? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is what happened today for all of us. He is risen. He is risen indeed for all of us. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank You. We thank You for the things that You have given us today. We thank You for the reminders. We're also sorry that it had to come to this direction. But we thank You. We thank You for Your Son, Jesus Christ, who bled and died, suffered, lost, then beat the power of death to give us a home to go to when we have finished our work here. Thank You, Father. Thank You that He is risen. He is risen indeed for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a particular need as we sing this last hymn, the prayer bench is open. And if not, I pray that you find those that you need prayer from that are strong and will lead you. May God bless you and thank you. Oh.
is worth living just because he lives. And now go in peace, brothers and sisters, knowing that today was for all of us, knowing that is why he rose up. May you be blessed now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, now and forevermore. Amen.